Hello everyone, this is Mary Gregory with uh, MAS Coding Solution. I want to welcome you all to our first class on coding and things uh, certification test. I am excited that we are now going to be changing our format a little bit. We'll still talk about uh, hot topics in coding, uh, but this week, uh, this month, we will be talking about the top missed coding concept on the CPC exam. If you have taken this exam before and you did not pass, this is a class just for you. Um, like I said, we're going to be doing more of these. Uh, we want to be a help to people. We want to play it forward. Uh, mass coding is not all about making money. Yes, we need to make money to keep the doors open. But at the end of the day, it's all about making you successful. And so with that being said, we're going to start our lesson for today on the top missed coding concepts on the CPC exam. We'll be talking about the top miss coding concept on the CPC exam today as our lesson. Uh, this is a CPT disclaimer. Don't be thrown out by the word 2011. Uh, this will apply to current coding in, with CPT. But we always have to have a CPT disclaimer. Uh, that's just part of how the AMA do business. And with that being said, MAS going to put their disclaimer out there. Ultimately, I want you to always remember, you are responsible for your coding. Mary Gregory, uh, all of us consultants, all of us teachers, we want to teach you the best. However, we can make mistakes. So always remember, you are responsible for your coding. It is your responsibility to research things out, but this, uh, what we are trying to do is to help you to get prepared to pass that test. What are some of the commonly missed topics on that CPC exam? Uh, we're going to teach you how to use your book. Most of the answers in, um, for the CPC exam is actually in your book. Now. As you all know or might not know, if you have never taken the CPC exam, first of all, CPC stands for Certified Professional Coder. That is an examination that is administered by the AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders. It is a very, very recognizable credential. Um, when people call me and email me and they say, well, what credential should I get? I said, well, at this time, there's two major players as far as coding credentials. That is uh, the AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders, and AHIMA. That's the American, um, American Health Information Management Association. The American Health Management Association is actually the organization that is responsible for administering the CCS. Now the CCS is the Certified Coding Specialist. That is a test that is very heavily uh, laden with inpatient coding guidelines. And what, what would you do as an inpatient coder? The CPC is more for the outpatient coder. It's more for the physician office. It's more for ambulatory surgery centers. So there's a big difference between those two examinations. And AHIMA actually recommends that before you take the uh, CCS that you have at least two years of coding experience. Now, there are people that have taken that test with less than two years coding experience and passed it. It just depends on the person. It depends on your preparation. Um, so we are not talking about the CCS today. Let me repeat that. We are not talking about the CCS today. Today, we're talking about the CPC, the Certified Professional Coding Examination. And we're going to be talking about those most commonly missed topics and how to use your code book to help you to pass this test. Now, uh, this test uh, have 150 questions. It's generally laid out in sections. There's uh, 75 questions, to my understanding, uh, for surgical uh, for the surgical section of your CPT book. 
remember your CPT book is divided by integumentary, muscle skeletal, cardiovascular, respiratory. And so you are going to get questions just about in every section, even if it's just one. But most of the time you're going to have more than one. Now the first slide that we're looking at today, we're talking about lesion. We're talking about excision or lesion. So many people miss these questions on the test when it comes to these excision or lesion. Um, now, if you have your CPT book, I suggest that you get your CPT book. I suggest that you stop this video and you go and you get your CPT book. Because you'll need your CPT book in order to follow along. In the CPT book, we have a section on lesions. Well, first of all, you as a coder or a potential coder must understand that your physician may not actually use the term lesion. What are some of the other terms that you may see being documented as a lesion? It could be a mass. It could be a malignancy. It could be a non-malignancy. It could be a, 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 a carcinoma in situ, meaning that it is a malignancy, but it's, very conf it's confined to a very small uh, spot. So you, uh, this test, when you take the CPC or even the CCS, they are really trying to determine and help you to have critical thinking skills. And so when it comes to excision or lesion, they may not use the word lesion. Like I said, they could use the word mass. They could use the word malignancy. They can use a lot of different terms. It's up to you as the coder to know what that term means. Now, one of the things that a lot of people are missing, when you are going to code an excision of a lesion, look in your CPT book. Now, I don't have my 2015 CPT book. I'm looking at a 2014 professional edition CPT book. If you have a different uh, edition of the CPT book, maybe you got the standard, then your page number will not be the same. So I won't give you page numbers. I'm going to try to give you the beginning of the category. Okay, in your CPT book, you will be, if you go to your section that begins with, uh, let's see, let's start with code number 11400. The first section begins with excision of benign lesion. And you'll notice that you have some rules and guidelines in that section. You should know this. So, uh, when, like, how is the lesion excised? When you're going to do an excision of a lesion, you have to know how was it excised. Well, if you look in your second category here, it tells you excision is defined as a full thickness through the dermal removal of a lesion. Think a knife. Think scalpel. See, that's when you excise something, when you have to cut it out. If they are scrubbing that mass away, that's not an excision. So you wouldn't be in this section here if they use some type of uh, scrubbing device. So this here means that they literally cut through the skin, excision. And then they say, what type of lesion is it? That's what I talked to you about. You got to know. Uh, they may give you a scenario that said, well, the patient have a melanoma. And the melanoma was on the arm. And the melanoma was excised and it was uh, 2.5 uh, centimeters. Well, you have to know a melanoma is a malignancy. So it, your paper is going to be marked wrong if you use a 11400 for a melanoma. Because a melanoma is a malignancy, so you need to be over here in category 11601. And that's how you have to know these things. Then we already talked about how large is the diameter. Is it a 2.5? If it's a 1.0, um, what is the depth of the excision? How far down did they go? Um, how is the defect closed? That is huge. How the defect is closed is huge. I'm going to stand up on this one and go to my board and point it out. How is the defect closed is huge. Because if it is closed with a simple repair, there's nothing additionally to code. It is included in that excision code of 11400, whatever the case may be, or the 116. However, if they do a skin graft, you will need a separate code. 
if they did a layer closure, you would need a separate coat. See? If they did a complex closure, you would need a, 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 a second coat. Now, if they actually did what they call a tissue skin transfer, you would not have a second coat because the transfer will actually be coated and not the lesion. And you may be sitting there thinking, now what in the world is she talking about? What is a transfer? Go in your CPT book to the category 1400. Now, of course, the proper CPT code would be dependent on um, the proper CPT code would be dependent on what size it is and what part of the body it's on. So if your patient, and generally this is a, a good little uh, hint, generally a tissue uh, transfers are done with malignancies. You don't see a lot of tissue transfers being done when a patient have a skin lesion and it's not a malignancy because generally they don't have to go deep to get that. But when it's a malignancy, they have to go deep. And when they go deep, they may have to get some tissue. If they remove the melanoma from the arm and it's deep, they may have to rotate some tissue from the lower part of the arm up into that area to cover the defect. That is what a tissue, um, adjacent tissue transfer is. When that happens, you will not code the 116 category. You will only code the 1400 category. That is so huge, you have to remember that. So uh, in talking about the defect closure, we actually have talked about these last two. Can the, well, the, the third one here, can the closure be coded in addition to the excision? Always keep in mind, your, your rules are in your book. Now, when you take this test, you have five and a half hours. You will not have time to re go and read every rule. Some rules you're going to have to know in your CPU unit, as we like to call it, that means up here in your memory bank. So you, you can't have it on a flash drive. You're going to have to have some rules up here in the memory bank, or at least know where to go find the rule and read it quickly. It's a five and a half hour test. Your time will fly by. So we talked about the closure. And the other thing you have to know, are there multiple lesions? Now, CPT has a rule about multiple lesions. And the, the rule is this. If each lesion is removed individually by a cut or by an excision, even if they're on the same body site, you code both. You don't add those lesions together. You code them separately. The only time you will add that lesion together is if in your documentation the physician tell you they made, a, made an incision and they was able to remove both lesions through that one incision. If you don't have that kind of documentation, then you have to code both. So, we talked about lesion excision. That's an area that people tend to miss. Shave lesion. Uh, it is what it is. When they shaved it off, they just get a knife or a razor and they just slice the skin off. That's a shave. Always remember, if they cut, they make an incision into the skin, then you have an excision. And just uh, be guided by these, these instructions are actually in your book. I suggest that you read your book. You study your book. The sharp, so they said shaving of the lesions, the sharp removal of an epidermal or dermal lesion that does not require any suturing. That's another key for you. If that documentation tells you something was sutured, you don't have a shaving. You have an excision. See, so a shaving, they just slice it off. There's nothing to suture it up. Uh, it's per lesion located on the trunk, arm, or leg. Note the size in your code selection. Uh, so you can read these on your own because these are just breaking them out by the different location where those lesions can be shaved. Uh, what else? Uh, coding uh, and lesion excision, per CPT excision is defined as a full thickness removal. That's in your book. If they ask you a question and say, what's the definition of an excision? You, you can just go to your book. The definition is right there in your book. Go to it uh, under, uh, is it beginning at the, uh, I believe, the 114 category. I tell all my students, myself personally, you must read your book. You must know your book. 
If you don't read your book, if you don't know your book, if you haven't studied these guidelines, you're going to struggle with the test. And code selection is based on measuring the greatest clinical diameter lesion plus any uh, margins that that patient may have. Now, in the real world, a physician, that when they're going to excise a lesion, they're always going to include the margin. Uh, I don't know, a lot of people don't sew now. A lot of people don't have to patch things up. But in the old days, when you had to put a patch on something, you had to have some margins. And you will always cut the material bigger than the cut, or bigger than what you needed to sew. And it's the same way at, uh, in surgery. So if you got a 2.5 um, lesion, the doctor going to cut more than 2.5. See? And usually they will tell you that the lesion is maybe it's a 3.0. Because what they have done is they have already included their, le their uh, size. Uh, in that. Now when you're taking the test, they may actually give you a coding scenario where they'll tell you the patient had a 3.0 uh, lesion and the physician went back and did some additional cutting. And he did on the right 1.5, he did on the left 1.5. Well you got to add those together, you got a 3.0, you're going to add it to your other 3.5 and your lesion now is going to be 6.5. And you have to know how to do that. It's in your book. Study it. Uh, so here's an example of the lesion measurement. And notice how they did it. The lesion was a 2.0 by 1.0 with a 0.2 centimeter margin. So they took the 2.0 2 plus the 0.2 plus the 0.2. And it came out to be 2.4. And or they, uh, you can do it the other way. Now, to me, you can, you can only do it one way or the other. Uh, so I got a 2.0 centimeter. I got a 1.0 centimeter. So this, these two you don't really generally add together. I think they may have down here. See, this here is the total sum of that lesion. And it's the largest here at 2.0. Then I take my 0 0.2 and uh, on the margin, so it was on both sides. That's why they have a 2.4. So make sure you know how to count your lesions. And you have great examples in your CPT book. We already talked about malignant or benign lesion. You may say, well, where would I find that? In your scenario, just like in the real world, a lot of times you can get it off your pathology. Now, there are times when that dermatologist, especially dermatologists, your general surgeons and your uh, plastic surgeon, they know a cancer. They know a basal cell. They know a squamous cell carcinoma when they see it. And so when they document it, I can code it. And so, but if I don't have it, I can always go to the pathology. And code selection is based on the diagnosis, your location, and the size of the lesion. And so let's just talk about benign and let's give you um, your areas that you need to talk, uh, look at. You can look at your book for that. I don't need to just go through uh, 114 or 116. 114 is benign. 116 is malignant. So you can look in your book and get that. And we already talked about adjacent tissue transfer or rearrangement. Now, the key to adjacent tissue transfer is this. They may not say adjacent tissue transfer. And so you have to know when the physician says this word here. He might say he did a Z-plastic. And see in the book it got Z-plastic. They may, he, uh, the doctor may say he did a W-plastic. Or they may say they did a VY-plastic. He might say I did a rotation flap graft. He might say I did an advancement flap graft. You have to know that when that type of terminology is used, you are dealing with a tissue transfer. Because this thing, this test goes back to you having critical thinking skills. See, in this real world of coding, my physician just said he did a rotation flap graph. I'm not going to send that question back and say, well, what is this? No, it's your responsibility as a coder to know what that is. And you're going to have to know that when you take this test. So, remember, so go, once again, go to your CPT book, study what a tissue, uh, what a tissue transfer, uh, uh, graph is. Study it out. 
in, that, in other words, what are they called? See, because your, your scenario may say the patient had a flap graft done. Anytime you see the word flap graft, you need to start thinking tissue transfer. You see the word skin graft, then that's not a tissue transfer. See, I always remember too with a tissue transfer, they never totally cut it away and move it to a new location. They rotate it. They rotate it to the new location. But if they have to actually excise it from one location and take it to another location, you are dealing with a graft. You're not dealing with a flat graft, but you're dealing with some type of skin graft. Notice that all excision includes a simple repair. And remember, intermediate and complex requires additional coating. So if you remember that, you'll do fine. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, right, okay, let's talk about repairs. Uh, they actually give you a number for your repairs, 1200, 12030, 131. You got to be guided by your body system. Uh, you can have a simple payout repair, intermediate repair, you can have a complex repair. And what else? Simple repair. What is a simple repair? When the wounds is superficial, typically involves the epidermis or the dermis, uh, or the dermis and it's a one layer. They may, they may use different sutures, but it's one layer repair. So just don't start, don't all say, well, I got a layer of closure because they may say they use two different types of suture. No, that does not make you have a layer of closure. A layer of closure is when it's more than one layer being closed. And now let's see if they'll talk about this at the, uh, in the next one. Intermediate includes the repair of wounds that in addition to what is described in the simple repair requires layer. And remember, you as a coder will not um, necessarily make that decision when your documentation is not sufficient. In other words, a lot of times in the real world of coding, you have an ER case and they say they did a wound repair. Well, I'm not going to assume it was layer. That some things have to be done. Well, ER doctors are busy, so they, when they say wound repair, we generally know that's a simple repair. Uh, so, in taking this test, if you want to close, if you want to co uh, code a layer closure, remember this: they're going to talk about closing more than one layer of tissue, and that is going to be your key. They can actually close one layer of tissue with a derma bond. Uh, or some type of adhesive glue. Look in your CPT book because an adhesive glue is considered to be a material that can be used in a repair. Sometimes you may actually have the second layer being closed with some type of suture and the top layer may be closed with some type of glue. And so that's still a layer closure. Now this is key. Notice here in the second bullet point, if you're following along on this with the slide, single layer closure are heavily contaminated wounds that have required extensive cleaning or some type of removal of some uh, particular matter. In other words, they got some foreign body. You may see this when somebody have a, motor, um, have a motorcycle accident in the ER. They got a lot of dirt and gravel in that wound and they have to do a lot of cleaning to get it cleaned up, then that could be considered a layer closure. Uh, and notice the book calls it intermediate repair, so sometimes you may actually see the term intermediate, sometimes you're going to see the term uh, layer. They just, they're one and the same. So if you want to code a layer closure, you as a coder, when you're looking in your documentation for the test, you're going to be looking to see, number one, did they re, um, put repair more than one layer? Or you're going to be looking in your scenario to see if that wound was dirty, whether there's a lot of foreign, body, a lot of foreign uh, uh, bodies in that wound, was it a real dirty wound, did they talk about cleaning that wound extensively? See, that's a key word that you would look for, uh, extensively. And this is another thing that I think sometimes people uh, miss it on the test. They would give you a scenario. Then they may give you the op note. They may not say extensive in that op note, but they have told you that the wound was dirty and 
was going to require extensive repair uh, in the body, maybe where they're talking about how the accident happened. So always be aware that if you see certain terms in your, uh, in the, it may be a two-part notes, let me see if I can explain. They'll talk to you about how the accident occurred, how did that injury occur, and so they, they'll talk about that and they'll tell you that the wound was dirty, it was heavily contaminated, you may see that type of term. Now you as the coder, when you get ready to code that, when you look in your op note, you're going to be looking to see now that the physician says something about that wound being heavily contaminated, dirty, and you may have a layer of closure. So, your complex repair, believe me, the doctor have to tell you the complex repair. Even at, uh, at the AMA tell you that, they say, well, we won't give you a, a true, to me, a true definition of complex. They said that's what uh, something the doctor has to give you. But now they did give us some hints where we could think it may be complex. Was there a scar revision? Did this patient have a scar that had to be revised? Was there, but notice once again, they got debridement here. They also uh, use the word heavily contaminated and debridement, I do believe, in layer closure. In, the, in your CPT book, you got a section on debridement. You need to read those. You need to highlight certain things uh, in that so you can uh, make sure you see it. Extensive undermining, key. Sometimes you, the, the, uh, your scenario may say the patient had extensive undermining. Now you may know you're dealing with a complex repair. Was there some type of stents or retention sutures put in? See, they may allow you to code it as a complex repair because you've got these words that are documented in your CPT book being documented in your scenario. What else we got? When we talked about adjacent tissue transfer already, also known as Z-plastic, W-plastic, rotation flap, and they are measured in square centimeters. Now, your, mo your wound can actually be a centimeter, but the... Uh, and that's, this is also true with your skin uh, graphs as well. That, that they are measured in square centimeters. Okay. And remember, when you're going to code, if a patient have a malignant uh, lesion removed and they have a rotation flap graft, you're not going to code the excision of the lesion. You're only going to code the flap graft, uh, or excuse me, yeah, the rotation graft. And it's in your CPT book. It's right there for you. Uh, skin graft necessary to close. And remember. Um, with the rotation flap graph, there's, when they rotate it from what they call the donor site, you don't code that. You're only going to code something going on with the donor, donor site if they tell you the patient had some type of problem when they began to rotate it from that donor site. So the donor site is not coded, only the recipient site. Where are you placing the uh, rotation graph? Where are you rotating it to? That is what's going to be coded. Skin graft necessary to close secondary defect is considered an additional procedure. So anytime you're having a skin graft done, then you want to coat. Uh, I, I'm not sure they get into all these skin grafts. They just, uh, it's a lot of things going on. We got skin replacement surgery going on now. Uh, CPT has really tried to simplify that for 2014, 2015, uh, the, the skin replacement. Be guided by your documentation. Don't read more into it that's there. And don't try to be the doctor. Now, a lot of you all probably said, she probably shouldn't have said that. No, sometimes we want to play doctor. So don't try to play doctor. You are taking a test, give them what they want. Uh, this uh, slide here is talking about the split thickness or full thickness or allograph or xenograph. Know that the xenograph is a pig graph. That's some type of uh, artificial graph. Most of it, really, they come from pigs. And these are your graph numbers, and you can go back and read that. This, this is a short video just to kind of help you uh, to know where to study, where to go. Uh, it's not really designed to teach you how to code. Uh, it's not a full-blown prep, okay? Uh, so split thickness skin graph, they talk about that. Autograph, know what that means? It means it comes from the patient themselves. They take it from the leg, put it on the arm. That's an autograph. Your full thickness skin graph, so that, they'll tell you all that. 
Uh, your aloe graft, uh, aloe graft, this is from a human donor, typically a cadaver. A cadaver is a dead person. They are also growing skin now in uh, the banks, the skin banks, uh, in laboratories. And that's why you have a section now strictly for skin replacement. Let me see if that's in our... Um, I'm going to look down for a minute. We are videoing, I understand that, but uh, some days you just have to look, you have to look down. Skin, uh, yep, skin substitute. That's 15271 if you um, got a new book. Okay, what else we got here? Um, these are your code ranges. I'm not going to go over your code ranges. You can go over those yourself. Uh, uh, you have to know what location. That's just common sense. It's going to tell you. Now, once again, it may tell you that the patient had a burn on the left arm. And then they will come down and they'll give you your art note. And maybe the doctor forgot to say left arm, left arm and the art note. Well, you still know it's the left arm because they told you the patient was burned on the left arm. So you can't say, well, this is missing in the art note. No, you have to put on your critical thinking skill hat and say, oh, they told me up here where it's at, but he just happened to forget it down here. Uh, so be guided by that. And remember with CPT, you'll find this true in uh, excision or skin lesion. You're going to find it true in skin repair. And you're going to find it true over here. C uh, CPT lumps certain body systems together. Now whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, that's the way it is. So if I have a, a, a trunk, arm and leg, and notice they may be the same code. That's why when you are doing coding, you don't put modifiers like right and left on the skin graph. So you don't do that. Your paper is going to be marked wrong. They may give you that as an option, but you can't do that. You know why? Because this code includes include trunks. You don't, you don't split the trunk up. Now, generally, yes, the doctor may do it because for, for examination, but you don't do it for coding. But see, you can have a right arm and a left leg, so you don't use like bilateral. You don't do that unless the book tell you that. But uh, you know, if you have a skin graft, you add all those sizes together, you add those wounds together, and that's how you do your skin graft. What else we got? So uh, the new skin substitute code. Notice up to 100 square feet, uh, square centimeters. Excuse me. First 25 square centimeters or less wound surface area, or you'll find that the terminology been changed in the book, it said parts there are. So if your patient came in and had a skin replacement and it was 100 and, I don't know, 110 uh, square centimeters, then you're, you're going to do your code for your first 100 square centimeters. And because 10 is part of 25, you'll do your additional code because it's at parts there are. Uh, CPT had to correct that because we was all over the place with that. We never knew what to do with that. So always look to see, and it's up to you to count it, they may just say, well, you know, the patient had uh, 100 square centimeters on the left arm, 100 square centimeters on the right arm. You got to know that's 200. You got to know I'm going to do the first 100 and I'm going to do 425 square centimeters for the next one. You, ha you have to know to do that. And you got to be able to do it quick. You don't have all day to do this test. Okay, so you can look at those yourself. I'm not going to look at those for you. And always remember when you're doing your skin graft, there's a code for cleaning that area, for preparing that area. And those are key words you're going to be looking for when you do your coding. Did they talk about cleansing the area? Did they talk about doing a scar release? That's for your skin graft. Okay? And they expect the people to close the wound up when they're doing skin grafts, when they're doing skin replacement surgery, so there will not be a separate code for a closure. So don't add a 120 codes, whatever your, your skin closure codes, don't add those to those skin grafts and or tissue transfer and or uh, skin replacement. So they got an example here. Uh, the patient has an excision of a painful cyst on the upper back. So where's the cyst? On the upper back. Uh, the lesion had previous uh, rupture. He had significant scarring. That may be important to you. Uh, I can't, I'm going to have to see my videographer going to have to help me to know if I can find a, a pen or something I can write on that won't mess up this, this board. Uh, you know what? Let's go over here to the whiteboard, if you don't mind. 
I'm going to walk over here to the whiteboard and I'm going to write some things on here that may be uh, significant. So it's upper back. We got extensive scarring. That may be significant. He also has a painful cyst on the left upper back. So how many cysts we have now? We have two. We got uh, one on the midline. So this is the cyst. We'll put those here. So right now we have two. Uh, he is allergic to penicillin. Take aspirin now. If I am coding for the skin lesion, I don't care anything about him being allergic to penicillin. Don't be get don't get thrown off by additional information that really don't mean anything to your coding. So what you want to do, if I was coding this chart, I'm going to go down to my scenario and say, okay. I'm going to look at my answer and say, did they ask me anything about a diagnosis? Do I have codes listed for allergies? If not, skip over the fact that he's on aspirin and my card is for blood pressure. Then if they don't have those for you to code, that's insignificant. That's good information, but it's not going to help you with your coding. So we got that. Uh, we got excision here, so they tell me it's an excision. Once a physician says an excision, I'm going to go through and I'm going to be looking at some things. And notice how he talks about, um, uh, I don't care about anesthesia unless they're telling me I'm coding for the anesthesia and they want me to pick up the anesthesia. And you know what, they got to prep the site, so I don't care nothing about that. This number 15 blade makes me know this is an excision. It makes me know I'm going to be in a 114 or a 116. That's an excision. It went deep through the dermis and into the subcutaneous fat. The tissue was dissected. Um, so it was care was preserved for histology. Once again, if I'm not doing the pathology, I don't really care about the histology, histology except to know if I need to go look at it. So they sent it to pathology, um, did a margin. It was determined, the surgical site was undetermined to a distance of 1.0 centimeter in order to present, uh, to prevent the dehence due to wound tension. He did an intermediate layer closure. That is key, people. So now I know I am going to have to least coat an intermediate. Say. And I don't care what they close it with. Don't get thrown off whether they're using nylon, glue, you don't care. Now, the final surgical length though is going to be important to me. 2.5. 2.5. And um, once again, like I said, I don't really care about all the, you know, the gauzes and stuff like that. I don't care about the post-op instruction. I'm not coding for that. So now. Um, so they got some things up here in blue. You may not be able to see it. I'm not sure. Uh, so they was talking about intermediate, uh, the distance. So the surgical repair was 2.5. So let's see what our answer is. Now that was just the first, uh, remember that was just the first uh, cyst. Now we're working on the second cyst. And remember with CPT rules, uh, each additional area or excision is coded when they have to use separate incision. Once again, same kind of blade. Uh, what's that? Uh, I'm trying to, me personally, I'm scanning to try to find my centimeters. Here it is. Cut through all this chase. It's good information, but you don't need it. What's important to code that excision? Location, depth, and what type of repair was done. So, 1.0. So there you go. I think 1.5 and then they may have done a 1.0. Total surgical repair was 2.9. So I had a 2.5 and a 2.9. And this, now uh, when you take the test, they're not going to lay it out as good for you. However, once again, you, you're going through. Just go through it. You know two on the back. What's my size? That's what I got to think. What's my size? And how did they close it? And one of them was a layer closure. Was this one a layer closure? No. Simple. So I'm going to have two excisions and one closure. 
Because, see, this is a separate closure, and this included with the excision. So, here we go. Here's our intermediate closure, because they did the 2.5 plus the 2.9, and now uh, it was probably in there, I'm kind of going fast. 2 by 9 excision, 1.1 and 1.9, and here are my codes. And for whatever reason, I never have understood this, but a layer closure is actually greater than an excision of a benign lesion. So it goes first, 120-32, then they did the 11402, and then notice they did a modifier 51. Uh, that's the same multiple procedures, because it was multiple. And notice we had to do 11402 twice, because somewhere on one of these, uh, we had the two benign sets. Remember we had one in the midline, and one in the lower or something? Well, see, you only got one back. Back is not cutting the midlines and upper and lower. So the 11402 represent both of those areas. You put modify 59 on the second one to try to explain to the insurance company that it is a separate um, area. All right. Okay. So that uh, take care of the integumentary system. Um, now, another area that uh, the AAP said... AAP um, sent us this PowerPoint talking about another area that um, pay, uh, students are missing a lot of questions have to do with this kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty. You know what people tell you the truth, I code these, and they appear to be identical. I, I, I'm like, okay, what's the big deal here? Sometimes they call it a vertebroplasty, sometimes they call it a kyphoplasty. So just be guided by what they call it in your scenario. If they call it a kyphoplasty, you want to go to your CPT book, you're going to go to kyphoplasty, and you're going to pick the code up. What is included in that kyphoplasty? See, once again, people, you have to pay attention to your details in this book, okay? Um, now, I'm using a little bit older book. I think 26, my 2015, I left them out of borrow it, so I'm going to have to buy a new one. Usually we are bad creatures for borrowing books and not giving them back. You know, I've done that myself. Uh, so I may use a different code, but look in your 2015 book. And it tells you that a percutaneous of the uh, vertebroplasty includes a bone biopsy. It can be unilateral or bilateral. What does that mean to you? When something is a unilateral or bilateral, what type of modifier you use? None. So you can't use a left or right of 50 when a code says you're not lateral or bilateral. You cannot do that. If they give you that as one of your options, don't choose that answer. If you do, your paper will be marked wrong. Now, in your book, I think in the newer book, they actually tell you all the things that is involved in that. Well, see, when they do those procedures, whether it's kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty, they have to create a cavity. They have to put the cement in. They have to use these little jacks and things to height the bone up. And so you don't you don't code all that. What they say you need to know is things to look for is a balloon used to create the cavity, kyphoplasty. How many vertebral bodies was involved? If they said L1 to L2, guess what, people? That's one. Most of the time, these are done in the thoracic area, maybe a little bit in the lumbar. So if they said uh, T9 to T10, that's one. T10 to T11, that's two. It's very important that you know how to count your vertebral bodies. It's important. And what type of imaging guidance is performed. And they'll usually tell you that. Uh, so revision to uh, the percutaneous vertebral plastic codes. Uh, does include that bone box and when performed. So if we got an example here, you had a vertebral plastic perform on the L2 and a bone box perform on the vertebral body, a T12. Well, uh, here we got a 225-221 and a 20-225. Why did they include the bone biopsy? Didn't that code say it include the bone biopsy? Now this is where your critical thinking skill have to come in and have to kick in quick. You don't have all day to think about it. The vertebral plastic was performed on the L2. The bone biopsy was performed on the T12. Two separate areas. In a case like that, you can coach your bone biopsy and add modifier 59. 
if the bone biopsy were actually done in the L2 area, then you could not code it. That's what they want you to know. Do not report modifier 50 with that. We talked about that. Code per vertebral body and code uh, imaging. Um, this is an older PowerPoint. I do believe under the 2015 codes, uh, imaging is included, be it a CT scan, be it an MRI. Be guided by that because it doesn't include all imaging. Maybe, uh, I think fluoroscopy is included, CT is included, and ultrasound. An MRI is not. And kyphoplasty, same thing. And this is a, a note that they tell you about. Personally, I wouldn't read that note. I read kyphoplasty. I might skim over it because at the end of the day, all this is just talking about is what he did, how he put the semen in, how he jacked the bone up. That's not going to change the code. What's going to change that code is if he did a different layer. So they talk about the T11 pedicle, uh, the T6 pedicle. You get into all that, you're going to get confused. Because at the end of the day, uh, we got a T11, right T6. Now, on our scenario, we only had just one T. So are they saying they got more than one T? See, this is a, I mean, excuse me, on our example, we only had one T code. So let's see how many levels we got. We got a T11 going on. We got a T6 going on. He put some cement at the T6. Uh, uh, did I see something? So this all may just be the thoracic area. So let's look at it. We just want to get to the answer. Yep, see? T6 and a T11. That's all you had to find. That was it. Your location. Because them putting the dye in, them putting the cement in, though they them doing the fluoroscopy, all that you have to know the fluoroscopy because they talk about imaging or if they did a CT scan, that's important. But the rest of that is not important. So we got our 22520 or 22522. Now remember, this is a little bit older PowerPoint so that your code could be different in 2015. Okay. All right, so here's the impression. Notice we talked about the T6 and the T11. Those are the two important things. And here's your answer. Uh, remember, if you're looking at your 2015 book, uh, your answer is going to be a little bit different for vertebroplasty or the kyphoplasty uh, because the changes that was made, I think imaging is included. We're going to actually um, end today with this particular area. We have talked about integumentary and we have talked about uh, muscle skeletal. Okay? Uh, so we want you to tune in for part two of the video because now we're going to be moving into uh, the cardiovascular area and some different body areas, uh, what I want to say, like the 3,000 section, 4,000. Uh, we don't want to rush through these videos. We want them to be, um, you know, good for you. And uh, so, okay, this is Mary Gregory. We're signing off for today. Remember to stay tuned for part two, part three, part four. We'll just see how far this goes. And I want to remind you all to please feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. And we also got our website. And we're in the process of updating our website. I'm excited about things to come. We're also going to be posting our new schedule uh, for next year uh, for uh, classes. A lot of people want to know what we was going to do this year. You know, this year is winding down. We got our CD10. It's just a lot going on. We will be uh, having a CDI uh, class in December of 2015. Uh, so that's that's it for today. I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, being your uh, instructor today. Please feel free to reach out to me via email. You can email me at, at Mary. I think it's Ask Mary uh, at MSCodingSolutions.com. Talk to you next time.